technical delay of 20 minutes. And uh, this week's talk of Tuesday would be hosted by Anshuman Acharya. Uh, This is Steve Ash, and he is currently working on PhD in astrophysics at Nice Germany. And uh, this guy doesn't need an introduction for sure. We, we all know him from Bora and uh, Telegram. And uh, this is a short story time for me because uh, I was from PCB background, and uh, I was one of those kids who was sent to uh, the medical stream because of parental pressure. And <laughs> Uh, yeah, one day I came to know about ICERs and ICERs through one of my score answer. I rebelled against my parents, woke up at 4 in the morning to study math, gave IIT, gave, gave NEST, cleared both of them and selected ICER volume for my future career. So, uh, the reason that I am here is uh, <laughs> contributed to this guy. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, uh, I guess I'm, it's audible to everyone? Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, as the, the yellow screen suggests, we'll have to probably, like this, uh, the text might be a little less visible. So I'll start off with like crediting all my collaborators because uh, my supervisor, Bernard Ashari, and uh, uh, really cool people across the uh, uh, that fans of the way tree and even the University of Farringen and uh, the Open University of Australia, they have been really helpful in helping me understand uh, this topic and actually work on it. So what we are going to talk about today is uh, the epoch of ionization uh, and before delving into that we should start with the basics and uh, I would say that yes, uh, I would not be sticking to any kind of script in this uh, entire talk. So if you do really have a doubt and you want to ask at that moment that you feel you cannot follow uh, what is happening, if uh, I could proceed further without clarifying that doubt, just raise your hand. We'll deal with it, then we'll move forward. There's nothing to worry about. So yeah, sure, let's go ahead. So uh, the, any story about the universe obviously starts from its birth. That's the big fact. And that's where we are starting the journey from. Uh, as you can see in this diagram, which, which is like a sort of a cartoon representation, and again, uh, maybe it's a bit less visible. Uh, on the left side of the diagram, you can see the bright flash, and that's what they, the artist is using to represent as the Big Bang. And okay, sure, we have the universe, it has started. Uh, the next thing that we have, uh, that astrophysicists have theorized, is that there is inflation and that means that really rapidly everything in the universe expanded over, uh, over a large range and what this meant was that everything that was really hot and packed together was suddenly spread out and thus started cooling down. So what we had here was like say, like for example you have the pop on plasma and uh, all these uh, particles which were at really excited states, they were cooling down. They're relaxing a bit as they start to drift further and further apart. What this meant was that uh, the quarks uh, the basically uh, were not just bouncing off each other, they were soon able to get together and gradually form protons. And as this continued, we, uh, like, what we believe was the next step was the formation of the first atom. And that was the atom of hydrogen, which is the simplest uh, thing that it did make. Of course, there was some helium and a little bit of lithium that formed, but uh, uh, we like that's just negligible. That most of the things that uh, that was there in the universe was hydrogen atoms, uh, and that was formed by, uh, again because everything was cooling down, the universe was expanding, and the protons were able to capture uh, the electrons. But then, uh, like what we believe was that there is these hydrogen clouds everywhere across the universe. It's just hydrogen atoms drifting here and there. The universe is cooling. Nothing much was happening. There were no stars yet. And we called this space the Dark Ages, uh, which is when there was nothing, the universe was just uh, practically lifeless if, if we consider this even the life of stars. And uh, yeah, so that was uh, pretty much it at that time. 
But now we know, like we are looking, like if you look at the from any telescope, you, you know that there's a lot of things that are there outside of the universe. Uh, like you have, of course, stars, planets, and moons, and everything. But we also have larger structures like galaxies, galaxy clusters, uh, and even uh, very uh, exotic objects like, say, black holes and neutron stars, pulsars, white dwarfs, everything. Like there's so many things that's happening in the universe. Like. In this diagram, we are currently at this phase where we have galaxies, which have a lot of things happening. And the place I left you at before was the dark ages. And in between this, there seems to be that a gap, which is represented by the question marks. Uh, and I'll get to, uh, get to why those question marks exist. Uh, the question marks exist because in today's universe, we see that uh, the stars uh, have mostly ionized the interstellar medium around them. The galaxies, because of all the stars and black holes and neutron stars, have ionized all the intergalactic medium around them. And this means that most of the hydrogen that existed as a proton and an electron together were again broken apart. So you now had just ionized hydrogen, which is just a proton flying around. And that was it. Like We now have see that most of the hydrogen in the universe exists in an ionized form. But in the dark ages, it was mostly neutral. So, what was again theorized, I'll stress it again, it's theorized, uh, was that there was a phase when the first stars formed, the first galaxies formed, that this hydrogen started getting reionized, because, which basically means that uh, it is again being reduced to the form of ions, uh, because of the formation of these stars and galaxies and other objects. And uh, that was it. Like once it was reionized to a certain extent, we had enough stars replacing the other stars, enough black holes replacing the older black holes, and enough neutron stars replacing the older neutron stars to continue keeping the sudden equilibrium. So this period, yes, let's go. Yeah, the question marks represent that period, and that's what we call as the epoch of reionization. Uh, there's a lot of question marks because. Frankly, we know very less about it. We, uh, we know that, okay, cool, we have this happening once we have the first things formed, like I mentioned, a lot of those, uh, different uh, astrophysical objects. And we know that, okay, cool, they are, uh, these objects will emit energy, which will uh, hit the neutral hydrogen clouds, break them apart, and we will get our, uh, uh, like, emit, like the, the proton and the electron. So what is happening is basically that the neutral hydrogen is slowly getting uh, uh, ionized and hence what you could, you could say is that at each time step, like if you look at the universe from its birth, like from the dark ages to uh, present day, uh, the amount of neutral hydrogen was reducing. And maybe what we believe could happen is that say if you have a galaxy as a bubble, like uh, you have a galaxy in the center, the, it will start uh, ionizing the hydrogen, neutral hydrogen around it. Then it will slowly uh, ionize a bit further, which are, uh, which are a bit further away. And gradually this bubble will grow larger. And <coughs> hence what we could do uh, is uh, to find out, like to basically find out the trend about uh, how did this entire process occur, is basically to see how did the neutral hydrogen evolve over time. But that's the problem, like I've been telling you that this is just a neutral hydrogen, like that's just a hydrogen atom just, just existing. Uh, how would you actually study it? Like that's a bit tricky, but of course, like uh, uh, astronomers always find a way. That's the, that's basically their bread and butter. So uh, there is a way to study it. So what was found was that, uh, like all the quantum uh, physicists found, uh, was that if you have a magnetic dipole moment as, as, uh, associated with the spin of a proton and electron, then there can be two kinds of uh, hydrogen atoms that can exist. One, where the magnetic dipole moments add up, uh, like the proton and electron have a weak, weak uh, magnetic field associated with the dipole moment, which uh, are basically uh, pointing towards the same direction, or you can have them in the opposite directions. When you have them in the same direction, which is the parallel case, uh, you would say that okay, they are adding up, and hence there's a little bit more of uh, like there's a direction to the magnetic field that exists. And when they're anti-parallel, 
you they would be uh, not exactly cancelling out, but cancelling out to a certain extent. What this means is that when you have a magnetic field, you are basically uh, then the atom is like because of the magnetic field it can move around. So it is at a slightly higher energy state. While at uh, in the antiparallel case, because they are cancelling out, they they are in a slightly lower energy state. But the problem is that these two are different by just a few micro electron volts. That is really very small. What, uh, what the, basically if you ask any uh, quantum chemist, they would call this a forbidden transition because if you have hydrogen atoms just there, it's such a small difference that they, like any random collision would take care of any differences that arise. Uh, like it could be parallel at one moment, anti-parallel at another. And there will be so many collisions that you cannot really say that uh, yeah, this is a transition I can look at. Like this is a transition where I can see that uh, when we go from the top case to the bottom case, this photon that we are saying should exist if uh, there is a radiative radiative cooling, not cooling, a radiative reduction of energy. Then uh, that's not something we can observe because they just uh, instead of radiating a photon, they just collide between each other and sort it out. Uh, so uh, this photon release is something all quantum chemists would say is technically formidable. But of course, everything in chem like in chemistry you would know that there is a caveat that are attached, and the caveat here is that it's not exactly formidable. I said that okay, we would be having collisions between hydrogen atoms, and then it would uh, de-excite. So we would not really see a photon being radiated. But uh, astrophysics provides you with uh, experimental facilities like none other. For example, in the intergalactic medium, the density of hydrogen atoms in these hydrogen clouds. Like when I say clouds, you would be imagining something that looks like the clouds we see in the sky. But uh, there's in astrophysical terms, it's slightly different. We have like about one atom per distance, several parsecs, and it's really far apart. Like each atom is really far apart from each other. So now they do not really have a scope to collide with each other. They need to travel to a certain distance to be able to collide. So if there is no collisions happening, you will be able to predict. Like now, if there is a uh, hydrogen atom which is uh, parallel in spin for its electron and proton, they would be able to radiate, like uh, it's just a little bit of energy, so maybe just a very weak photon, uh, but they will be uh, radiating instead of colliding. Uh, but you would again say that because of such low energy, can we really look at these photons? But there is another catch, the universe has a lot of hydrogen. So what this means is that when you have a lot of fuel hydrogen around, and uh, it is so uh, less dense, then this uh, uh, photon that each of these hydrogen atoms releases uh, can actually be observed. And the wavelength of this translates to about 21 centimeters, and that's why we call it the 21 centimeter line of hydrogen. And we can basically use it to look at where neutral hydrogen exists, because neutral hydrogen will have a proton and electron which have their spins pointing up, which will then flip and release this photon. So, if you can basically see, okay, uh, at, from this time of the universe, we are getting this much amount of students and your photons, and from another time, we are getting this much, and from where in the sky are you getting it from, you can basically map how the neutral hydrogen was, was distributed. And yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Uh, it is, you can say how they are distributed, and if you can get an idea of the timeline, which you can, because uh, the, uh, if you are looking at further away sources, we are also looking back in time because of the way uh, the limit of uh, traveling, traveling of light works. You can ask me later if uh, it's, it's not obvious. But yeah, sure. So uh, we can look back in time. We can look at how uh, neutral hydrogen was distributed across time. And uh, this gives us an idea of the formation of the bubbles which are ionizing this neutral hydrogen. And not only that, we can get an idea of how the bubbles were shaped, how they, how fast did they form, how uh, did they vary with time, and this gives us an idea of what could be inside those bubbles, which is which is basically uh, ionizing the neutral hydrogen and changing it to ionized hydrogen. So you can get an idea about what was it that formed earlier.
Like was it, was it that the first stars just formed uh, and gradually collapsed into galaxies? Or were galaxies as, uh, just as uh, nebulous clouds formed first, which then became the birthplace for stars? Uh, or like with many other things, like when did the first black holes form? When did the first neutron stars form? You can get a lot of this information from basically the distribution of neutral hydrogen. And let's see if we can get this to play. If not, we can <coughs> quickly go yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll give a quick uh, explanation. So what we have here is uh, the yellow is basically all neutral hydrogen, and this is a simulation. Uh, it's uh, uh, of one of our colleagues, and uh, they basically try to simulate how across time this uh, yellow neutral hydrogen gets converted to ionized hydrogen, hydrogen which just show as purple. So I'll just play it. It's quite interesting because you see small bubbles form and they uh, they do change in color. Like they, they start to become slightly more yellowish sometimes, but sometimes they just run away and become fully purple. And as it progresses closer and closer to uh, the present day of the universe, we see that the purple dominates. Yeah. So we we can find a lot about uh, the universe with these neutral hydrogen photons, like the experiments in the photons. But there's a problem. Uh, after all these things, uh, of course, it would be too good to be true if we already had observed them. And uh, that's the problem because uh, if you remember from the early diagram, uh, and if somebody kept track of the redshift uh, axis in that, the redshift that we are look, we are concerned with is at around uh, say redshift 10 to redshift 6, or say redshift 20 to redshift 6. And either uh, redshift 10 is basically the uh, one billion one billion years from the birth of the universe. So we are looking back like 12 billion years uh, into the past of the universe, and that's difficult because again, as I uh, like, as I've mentioned here, to look back in time, we need to look further away. And if you're looking further away, means there are a lot of other things that have the capacity to come, come in between you and what you want to see. And in our case, one of the biggest problem is the Milky Way. The Milky Way is beautiful, definitely, but it is also covering a large patch of a sky and we basically need to cancel it out, remove all the photons coming from it so that we are able to look at what is behind it. And unfortunately for us, or maybe fortunately for uh, galactic astrophysicists, there are a ton of galaxies in the universe. Like these are just three or four of them, but we have to look at millions of galaxies which can come in between us and the uh, redshift that we want to look at. So what we have to do is basically model what do uh, galaxies typically look like, create a uh, system for that and then remove remove all of those photons from there. And at the same time, be careful that we are not removing the video similar photons which we want to observe. So, uh, uh, we have like, we are trying to do, uh, still observe it, like, we are not given up yet. Uh, and we use radio telescopes for that because the video similar line and even after getting redshifted is in the radio regime. But the radio regime is uh, also problematic because it's the lowest energy regime in, uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum. So what this means is that anything you do can uh, release radio uh, photons which can interfere and cause noise. For example, uh, we had uh, an issue with uh, the telescope we are using, the low frequency array at the Netherlands. Uh, and that was that uh, there was one guy who thought that civilization was ending and he had to set up a cabin near the uh, telescope. And this guy had a small radio sh uh, radio to hear to the world news and basically prep for the world ending. And the problem was he used to switch it on at like at midnight and every time we, we uh, someone was using the dishes which were closer to this this guy's shack which was very well hidden in camouflage so we really didn't know about it. Uh, people were seeing noise and uh, 
that is like it took a while to figure it out and then they had to convince him to please relocate his um, survival shack or whatever but uh, it ended up with people having to write papers about how they cancel the shack noise and uh, yes, so that happens. Uh, even if you drive a car nearby, or if somebody forgets to uh, keep their phone at home before coming to the telescopes, the day, that day of the observation are completely ruined. And uh, yeah, like I said, they have to remove as well the foreground consistent, consisting of stars, galaxies, and a lot of other things. And I, I just started to explain this graph that I've been showing for a while. Uh, so what this graph shows is the redshift on the x-axis, and basically the strength of the 21 cylinder signal on the y-axis, which is the, uh, the power of the signal. Uh, we have used this, these black dash and dotted lines from uh, basically different kinds of simulations, which you can already see, we, they don't agree with each other. We use two different simulations, they say two different things. Brilliant. Uh, and the points that we have scattered above are basically the observations that we have. So, even in the best case scenario, we have an order of magnitude difference between what we observe and what we expect. Uh, and that's why what we have, what people have just been reporting is that, okay, cool, we have found the power. The power is definitely less than this. Like, we cannot re really remove more noise and this is what we report. And uh, one of the solutions for uh, getting over this was basically longer observations. We have, uh, using the low frequency array, somebody suggested that so far, we have looked at it for 100 hours of observations, which is about 10 nights of observations. Why not look at it for 100 nights? 1000 hours of observations will reduce the noise and uh, the signal to noise ratio will go up. Great solution, but very difficult to implement. And then we have the SKA, which is coming up, which has plans to uh, have about 100 nights of 100 hours of observation, 1000 hours of observation, which is also uh, something that we can try for, but for that first we have to wait for the SK to be built. And uh, there's also other telescopes which are uh, trying to go for 1000 hours of observation, uh, which focus on other airships. Which is all great, but that's a, uh, just longer observations is not going to help us. As I mentioned earlier, simulations don't agree. So what we expect is also not something that we know about. So we are trying to basically look for a signal that we also don't know what it exactly looks like. Uh, and those two dashed and dotted lines you can see, they, uh, at redshift 10, they have almost uh, two orders of magnitude difference. So, yeah, so we need to kind of understand what we are looking for as well. So, coming to what I've been doing, like, uh, so finally, let's talk about the project I've been working on, is basically using the low frequency array telescope, which actually looks pretty beautiful. It's a set of village in um, the Netherlands. And uh, we use a signal extraction technique called Gaussian process regression. Uh, issues that crop up with it. But even there, we see that it, uh, the detection that we get it covers uh, the signal that we have fed in within the two, uh, two sigma uncertainty bounds. So that is fairly good. And we see that in both cases, the, the SNR is also decent. So uh, it is with an expectation. But uh, of course, we want to look at improvement. You do not want to, like, while we would love to observe 100 hours and I would love to get my hands on the data, it's still a lot of work and you do not want to go into uh, that kind of stuff. But uh, if we have to, we will. But uh, until then, we look at improvements and see what we can do. And then we want to apply this to real data. Like I said earlier, the, just the plain vanilla Gaussian process regression had been applied to uh, about 10 nights of data from the low power telescope. So maybe if we uh, apply a machine learning plus GPR and we can apply it to the same data, we can compare what kind of values we get. So that's what we are going doing right now. But at the moment, we have some good things. We can say that whenever the signal to noise ratio is greater than say 0 0.001, if uh, you see a signal which has that kind of signal to noise ratio, it will be within the two sigma uncertainty bounds that we get. Which is pretty amazing. Like we are um, we know that we cannot get a detection if its SNR is less than 1, but if it is such a low value and we are still able to say that we can reduce the range that, okay, this is the range within which a signal will be. We are saving a lot of time. You don't want to explore the infinite possibilities that the universe can be. Now you have a range within which you can now explore and uh, try to narrow down your search, which is a great success. And 
Uh, lastly, yes, the possibility of successful detection with 192 observations is still existing, right? If, what if uh, the universe is in such a way that we get a decent SNR with 192 observations, then we on a day have a detection. Yeah, so that's about it. I guess we can be open for questions now. Okay. Yeah, uh, but uh, you guys, uh, uh, do you want to just speak up loudly? Or? I just speak up loudly. Yeah, so my question was, uh, you're talking, like, telling us about like, uh, all the foreground noise that we have from like, stars or the galaxies and stars, yeah. without knowing the number of these galaxies, without approximating, how are we able to remove the... Uh, noise from that. Yeah, so uh, we we do not have an exact number, but we have like if you look at it, uh, what we what is basically uh, suggested from our understanding as well as our observations so far is that the universe is more or less isotropic at the large scales. So if you if you have like we do not know the exact number in whatever is this like in the uh, entire observable universe. You can just observe this patch of the sky, count the amount of things that are there, look at how they vary, because uh, they should, uh, because of isotropic principle, uh, what it means that even in that bubble, you would see all kinds of varieties of stars and galaxies. Uh, then you can then say that, okay, if whatever is here, is there, should be there everywhere, so you can just extrapolate from that. So what we do is that we say these are the kind of stars we have, these are the kind of galaxies we have. So we model for something that a general thing that, assuming that this is what is uh, like all this variability of different kinds of stars, different kinds of galaxies, is the same across the universe. So we create a function from that and try to subtract that. Uh, but of course, it is not perfect. That's that is very true. It is very very approximate and uh, it is uh, because it's so strong because there's so many stars and galaxies between us. Uh, the major problem has been that most of the time they, uh, the, the people who try to model these try to be a bit more conservative and they end up uh, removing the, sig the actual dimensional signal itself. So most of the time that's, they just cancel out what they want to observe and then they end up with something. <laughs> that, is, that is indeed a problem but this is how we are approaching it so far. Yeah. In the previous talk of astronomy, yeah. uh, we got to know about that Dark matter is a big asteroid by uh, researchers. Yeah. And, and uh, did you consider dark matter in the simulation? Uh, dark matter, like because we uh, dark matter does not produce photons, it does not really contribute photons that is, uh, cause issues. But uh, dark matter does <coughs> cause uh, uh, issues in terms of how do galaxies shape our planet and their structure overall. Yeah. So that goes into consideration in the stars and galaxies, uh, how they form and. Uh, basically, the template of galaxies and stars that we get is influenced by dark matter distribution and things like that. So, it is taken into consideration, but not directly because they are not going to be Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, for that we have to basically, uh, like you need to get a really strong detection first because uh, doing that is indeed difficult to be able to say that this is the source of this. It could very well be that we end up subtracting everything, we forget to subtract some some nearby dust clouds and something and it's the uh, photons that radiated from there are what we're detecting. So you, what you need to do is uh, not just like what we do, uh, what I was showing was at one redshift around redshift 9, you would want to have slices of universe. Like you get a detection, if you get something, uh, a very strong detection at redshift 9, you would want something at redshift 8, uh, okay, redshift 10 or redshift 8, which basically shows you that uh, whatever you're seeing here is correlating with what you are seeing here and here. Because that's basically the evolution of how neutral hydrogen is, uh, because they are gradually getting ionized. So at each redshift, you are looking further into the universe. So the shape, the overall distribution of these neutral hydrogen clouds are correlated. So you want multiple observations across redshifts, and it should agree. If there's a disagreement, you know there's something going wrong. So how do you, uh, like, uh, 
understand when when this photon started traveling and how how far it yeah yeah <coughs> yeah so uh, for that like you know, when you're looking at this uh, like when you're looking at the sky that is the, the redshift that you're uh, looking at would be defined yes because of the, how far the photons have traveled you know that how much they would be redshifted and that gives you the range in which you want to expect the photons so you basically take all the data cut it down and look at a very narrow frequency range from the beginning so we look at a range of about 12 megahertz uh, and we are like so that basically there is nothing spurious that goes on there and we are already limiting ourselves then you uh, because you have calculated each of these like for this redshift this is the range this redshift is the range and then you can uh, see um, up till that redshift like how if you evolve these stars and galaxy uh, boxes how much do you need to take into consideration uh, their uh, influence on the observations. So again, these are all very approximate things. You, uh, we do not have exact models yet. The only thing that one can do at the moment is to improve those models and one of the ways is to like uh, actually improve what we are looking for which is the Renton middle line and the other way is to basically improve the uh, foreground modeling and things like that. So yes, it is indeed a problem, but we are you try to minimize the problem. We, we are not yet at the uh, at the stage of solving the problem. Yeah. This is a slightly unrelated question. Okay. About, uh, you just said more about uh, low power itself. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, so because it's a radio telescope, it's about your planets to around the data, and then you also have built the other. Yes. Simulations are. Isn't the simulations are really part of the telescope? Yeah, no, Grizzly is uh, it's, uh, another group is doing it. So yeah, they are completely. Low far is in the Netherlands. This group is in Sweden and Israel. So. And the data stored, whenever you have got an observation, is on site or is it also somewhere else? Uh, uh, can you repeat? Uh, like, for example, when you're observing for 10 or 100 times. Yeah, yeah. Where is the data stored while they are observing? Because that also requires electronics, right? Yes, so uh, like there are transmission lines and they take it away from the center of the radio telescope. Uh, you, of course, even the transmission lines have cause noise, so you have to model for that and subtract that. So I'm happy I don't have to do all this. The raw data analysis is done by other people who really have a difficult task because. Uh, even from night after night, things can change. Like if you observe for 10 nights and you go for an 11th night, if the weather that day is slightly off, the uh, it would affect how humidity uh, sticks to your instrument, sticks to your, uh, if, even if it percolates down to the ground, how does it affect this, the wiring and everything, and it will change how the noise pattern is. So it is a difficult task. But yeah, that's to minimize it, they take it away, store it at the University of Groningen, which is uh, several, like, I'm not sure how far it is, but yeah, it is decently far enough. Yeah. Yes, but the the thing is uh, that now you uh, reach one of the biggest difficulties of uh, astronomy, uh, funding. So. Uh, uh, the thing is, uh, you can do radio astronomy from the ground. So, it is really difficult to convince someone that, okay, we can do it from the ground, but it will be better up there. They want uh, they want to see how it is better in terms of money being saved. And for them, like you slogging off on your work is not really money, it's your time, they don't really care too much. But, but uh, people are actually working on this. They are, there's this, uh, on the far side of the moon, there's this crater. They want to build a telescope dish into that. They go, uh, I think I forgot, some lunar telescope, uh, radio telescope. And uh, it has been progressing. Like the European Union is uh, ready to fund it to a certain extent. So they have to just keep showing that, okay, this is why we need it. This is... But yeah, it would be cool to uh, be up there because you remove all sorts of terrestrial noise. That's a very good improvement. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. This particular thing, database can also be used for that. Yeah, you can get uh, basically uh, to understand the distribution of galaxies and stuff like that. You, you 
would be help, it would be helpful to have JWST data. So we also talk to people who work with JWST and also people who develop simulations of what we expect from JWST to basically help us with this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, for galaxies, it's quite simple. You have lots of stars. So whenever you are forming these stars, once they are formed, they are radiating photons. Most of these photons will be absorbed into hydrogen. Besides, because what we believe is that first the interstellar medium, which is the medium within the galaxy, when that gets uh, ionized, then it goes outside and starts ionizing there. With black holes, it's actually more interesting. Um, if you have a black hole and you have accretion happening onto it, then what happens in that situation is that uh, things are falling into it with so much energy. Like you have, you have a lot of things falling into it, it's ripping things apart. So if you're ripping things apart while you're like chugging, chucking it into a basically a hole, well, you get a lot of debris around it. And this forms an accretion disk. And this accretion disk is where basically if anything else comes, it collides, it also breaks apart. You get a lot of things uh, happening and in that environment, you're able to generate radiation because of all that. And even while things go into the black hole, some of them, it is, uh, black holes are messy eaters. It doesn't just go perfectly into it. Like if it gets dragged into it, stretching it out, the further part could get tossed out. And that goes out like in, uh, in the form of X-rays from a black hole and uh, the rest goes in. So you now have this spinning uh, disk, accretion disk around black holes radiating uh, photons which are mostly in the radio wavelength and then these two jets in X-rays that the black holes release. So that's how the black holes are expected to contribute. Although you would want a decent number of black holes to be formed before this and their contribution becomes significant. So uh, basically getting to know uh, if black holes contribute to neutral hydrogen at any being ionized at any stage, you get an idea about when the first black holes in the universe form. So this is kind of a uh, very essential question to be answered uh, to have an idea of the entire framework of the universe. Okay, thank you very much. We have simulation of uh, 21 centimeter photon. And yes. But how are we supposed to know if uh, the values we are putting into the simulation are yes. correct or not? Because there are many instances where uh, the uh, initial values are also wrong. Yeah. And that effect is still. Yeah, so what we are trying to do basically is that we are, uh, like in our case, we are developing this uh, fitting function. By getting a training data set where we are essentially randomizing the initial condition parameters. So we have say about 7,000 or 8,000 such simulations. And then we have about, uh, we then test it to see, uh, we take 2,000 more random simulations to see that uh, we didn't miss anything. Like if the entire scale of validity that uh, we got from these 8,000 is, does it, uh, whatever we learned from that, does it also apply to these smaller test data set of 2000. If it agrees, we then proceed to use it. So what we are saying is that we don't know what the right answer is, but if we have a lot of answers, hopefully one of them is the right one. And we are saying that, okay, it is able to give us the same result, like the same power spectrum, like how powerful is the signal at different uh, uh, levels. Uh, but it need not be that those, that is, those are the only physical parameters that the universe has. There could be more, but we are able to get the same result using these parameters. Yeah. Uh, you said something about that parallel spin hydrogen instead of colliding. Yeah, so uh, like the spin parameter is something inherent with all the, these fundamental particles. And you can sum, it basically gives a little bit of a magnetic field to each particle. So if you have this proton and electron whose magnetic field are pointing towards the same direction, like its magnetic field is like this and this one also like this, the, it gets an overall addition at this range towards one direction. Like, okay, this is the overall global north for that atom. Uh, 
If you do not have that, like if you have them to be in the opposite directions, the magnetic fields will cancel out and this arrow, even if it's pointing in the same direction, it will have less amount of energy associated with it. So every time you have any field, it is uh, basically called, the spin is causing the, it to have, because of the interaction between fields, you are causing the atom to have a tendency to move in, uh, along the magnetic field, but these are charged particles. And uh, this tendency is broken down if you flip it around. So if you look at the overall energy of the uh, system, you would say that something which has a tendency to move has a slightly higher energy as compared, because it's a magnetic potential energy associated with that. And something which has a less tendency to move because its magnetic fields are cancelling out for its uh, proton and electron will, have, will not move much. So in the universe, everything wants to reduce its energy and relax. Uh, and the easiest way to do it, because it's such a small difference, is to just, if there's another atom nearby, just collide with it, uh, release your energy that, of the movement that you had, that this will flip the electron's magnetic uh, moment, and then the hydrogen atom is in a relaxed state. But if you do not have that option, then the only other thing that's left is to radiate a photon. Will it happen or not is something completely random, like, at any particular instant, you cannot say if it will happen or not. Yes, or uh, are there any other further questions you guys can like reach me out? That's completely fine. Uh, oh yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, these radio waves, uh, like they they have they require certain time to travel the particular distance. Yes. So, what the provide is the foresight into the past, how the universe used to get that from Yeah. So, according to you, what could be the more important method to see the universe as it is now? Uh, for that you just need, uh, like, uh, you, because even now you have photo which, uh, even the sun emits in different uh, wavelengths. So, the sun also emits radio waves, sun also emits a certain amount of X-rays. So, uh, you can use any kind of, uh, any, what kind of thing you want to observe basically decides what kind of uh, wavelengths you focus on. Because radio waves require very less energy, so if you're looking at a less energetic system or which is nearby, then you can use that. Uh, or if you have if you have something that is really high energy, like for example, if you want to look at the stellar corona of a star nearby, then you look at the X-rays. So basically, that's the thing. Like. Even uh, the issue that we have right now is that even these stars and galaxies are emitting radio. So a photon that is coming up and traveling a lot, and a photon from a nearby star emitting radio. Both of them, uh, we are receiving both of them at the same time. We are just staring at the sky. So uh, you basically want to dis uh, distinguish between those, uh, but you can like look at anything. Like there are people who use radio telescopes to look at nearby galaxies or nearby even nearby stars. Fine, I guess then we can wrap up. And if, uh, we also have a, like a sort of informal discussion about like, any kind of questions about like ISR and PhD and whatever. Go uh, going till uh, to this these kind of projects and things like that, or any kind of general doubts you might have, we'll deal with that tomorrow from seven to eight. Hopefully tomorrow will be on time. I do have a slide, but if it doesn't work, that's okay. Um, because we would want a more discussion, I think, kind of thing. So, if, other, if some of you can show up tomorrow, that's great.